Good evening. My name is Lisa Thomas, and tonight I am hosting the Martin Luther King Legacy in Davis program. Today we have with us Reverend John Pamperin. He will be uh, saying some words about Reverend Martin Luther King, as well as Reverend Timothy Malone, and Professor Terry Turner, and Dick Holdstock. Thank you all for joining us this evening. They will be providing some insight on their experiences in traveling um, to, do, to lead a um, march in Alabama. So at this point in time, I would like to uh, go to the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech. So we'll listen to that for a few minutes and then I will get on with introducing my guests. Thank you for joining us. Tomorrow, leader of our nation, I have the pleasure to present to you Dr. Martin Luther King, the I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today signed the Emancipation Proclamation. This momentous decree came as a great beacon light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. 100 years later, the, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. 100 years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity 100 years later. The, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. And so we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. In a sense, we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men Yes, black men as well as white men would be guaranteed... During this program, we would like to highlight the experiences of our guests today and what they experienced traveling from Selma to Montgomery during a several-day march in uh, 1965, March 16, 1965. But before we interview some of our guests, we'd like to now turn to Reverend Timothy Malone to add some of your comments and thoughts about the mood at this time and the significance of Martin Luther King. Well, first I'd like to thank you for having us here today. It's a privilege and uh, it's an honor. Um, what stands out in my mind most today is that um, the things that Dr. Martin Luther King fought for and died for are still very much a part of the struggle that exists today at the beginning of the 21st century. The fact that we had an election that was essentially 
uh, handed to the current uh, president uh, select uh, George Bush on a platter by the Supreme Court, and particularly that um, it occurred at a time um, when um, blacks in the South have not been treated fairly at the uh, voting booths, that they were given the, the worst equipment. Um, the poor areas were given the ballots that were had a higher percentage of malfunctioning. Something is wrong. We have a long way to go in America. And I think that uh, King's message of equality, King's message of justice is still strong and relevant, as relevant today as it was when he died uh, April 4th, 1968, or was assassinated, I should say. Um, and I think our challenge now is to, to make that dream a reality, because King was really not an idle dreamer. His, his impact came because he was making his dreams come true. He was a man of action. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of character. He was a man of passion. And he was willing to give everything he had, his life, in order to make his dream come true. So amidst all the death threats, amidst the uh, murders of civil rights workers, uh, the assassination of uh, Malcolm X, the assassination of Medgar Evers, the uh, murder of Goodwin, Swerner, and Cheney, and Viola, Viola Luizzo, um, King still persevered. He refused to, to retreat and go back into academia or to, to retire and give up the struggle. And so he gave his life so that we could have a better life. But the struggle still continues because in every true democracy, every person counts and every vote, vote counts. And in my opinion, that did not happen this last election. Um, so we're facing some some challenging days ahead, but I believe that in the long run that we will uh, will be a better nation because of the struggles in front of us and because of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and people like those who are around this table today. Thank you, Reverend Malone. Thank you, Lisa. I would now like to talk a little bit about the bus trip in 1965. In, on March 16, 1965, a group of individuals from Davis went on a bus ride from Davis to Selma, Alabama to march to Montgomery. This was to follow Martin Luther King and his dream. I would now like to turn to some photos of the citizens of Davis boarding the bus and heading on their journey. Would someone like to add commentary about the first one? Yeah, that bus is right in front of the Davis Community Church. And uh, there's a lot of people that were pretty uptight. <laughs> they were getting ready to go on that bus. People that were uptight about getting on the bus, people were uptight because they couldn't go on the bus. Right. You know? <laughs> and that's uh, Dick Holdstock speaking yeah. there. A lot of us had more hair. <laughs> <laughs> yes. what, what were the times like in Davis? At that time, what was the mood? Well, it, it was a smaller town, wasn't it? It was, uh, for me, it was, I, I never could figure it out. I just came here. I'd only been here for a year, and uh, I was sort of a transplant from back east, so it was just a very different sort of place. Um, I thought it was an interesting place to, to be going to, on a march from, and uh, because I thought the sociology of the community wouldn't propel such a thing, and so I was always pretty surprised that it happened. But I think uh, <clears throat> John and others helped to go, so interesting. It's about 10,000 people and approximately 4,000 st yeah. students at that time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's Reverend John Pamperin speaking. How about the second photo? What, what's going on there? Oh, well, it's the Lily Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama, yeah. and people are we we had a lovely time with the our hosts there that night, and we sang songs together with uh, Dewey Pruitt, who was the minister of the Davis Community Church, lit, playing the piano. And we all got dressed. John shaved his beard off, and, <laughs> and I cut my hair, and everybody kind of gave themselves nice and trim and put on ties and all that sort of thing. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'd now like to talk to. Um, John Pamper in a bit. Thanks again for joining mm -hmm. us, John. Thank you. 
A brief history. Reverend John Pamperin is a street minister and crisis consultant for the city of Davis. He is also a member of the Yolo County Citizens for Affirmative Action. He is also a campus minister at the Cal Aggie Christian Association. John Pamperin attended the University of Chicago Divinity School through the Chicago Theological Seminary, graduating in 1963 with a degree in divinity. It is my pleasure to introduce the leader and organizer of the Davis Contingency to Selma, Alabama, Reverend John Pamperin. First of all, what inspired you to organize citizens to go on this trip? What was going on at the time, and, and what gave you the wherewithal to round up all these people to take a bus ride clear across several states? Well, Lisa, those of us that graduated from various seminaries uh, <coughs> in the year 1963 really were trained to understand our commitment to uh, Christianity to be one of social action and social change. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so when we arrived at our, our new jobs, uh, I was uh, participating in the campus ministry from 63 to 77, actually, Lisa, mm -hmm. at the Cal Aggie Christian Association. We were pretty confident uh, of the spirit of those Kennedy years that uh, uh, action would create change, and we trusted the uh, uh, American dream to some extent that uh, all people could be included. So why, wh why you? Why, why did you decide well, to take uh, Well, per personally, uh, I was responding because I was a great admirer of Martin Luther King before then, mm -hmm. in terms of his writings and his actions, uh, writing to the call that he had made through the National Council of Churches for ministers and uh, members of churches to join him in this march. And so personally, when he called, I, I talked to a number of people and felt that we should go. Okay. How did you motivate people to, to take on a, a mission like this? Well, the ministers, I tried to make them feel guilty, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, really, I had the freedom, Lisa, in terms of my work and, uh, and the freedom of, of my particular ministry to try to translate how important it would be to the, to the local congregations. And then um, probably more significant was that, uh, like Dick and Terry, uh, had these jobs that uh, they were going to have to leave for a week. And that was a, probably the most difficult thing in, in, in trying to stir up interest is uh, what kind of sacrifice, kind of that everyday sacrifice were people going, would they be willing to make uh, to join the march. Uh, it was important to have uh, a lot of people from Davis, just as it was important to have people from throughout the country, in which we were trying to demonstrate that it was time now for this social change, and you had a cross-section of America that was supporting the change. And then we felt, those of us within the church, that, uh, that King, who was uh, uh, not just a pastor of a church, but also a uh, really brilliant theologian, mm -hmm. uh, had the depth and grasp of these social issues that we were in good hands in which uh, we would not only uh, contribute to his in insight of change, but that he would be able to use us in very constructive ways. What kind of, um, like you said, sacrifices, what kind of prices did people end up paying ultimately when they returned in terms of their job security? Um, were, were there financial, well, I assume financial costs, but were there any other um, risks that people were willing to take in terms of jeopardizing their employment, for example? Well, I, I think one, uh, one minister, not local, uh, did lose his job. Uh, actually, the congregation then asked him to leave. He was not renewed the next year. I, I think also that uh, everybody that I know 
was uh, put into a position of translating why they went. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always felt that that was maybe the most constructive part of the whole experience is, is translating um, what experience that we had and, uh, and then act on that experience in which uh, the legacy continued as, as, the, uh, as this program is to be about. But that that happened immediately. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, with some rejection. Uh, in those times. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, at least I had the feeling that this was a real action which was going to be translated into our personal lives and, and our personal commitments for more than just this time. I was very confident of that. Of course, I was very young then too, <laughs> so uh, I felt uh, uh, that this was what America was supposed to be. And, and everyone system. felt that it was worthwhile and yes. in the end, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, oh yes, I think that was, uh, there was real bonding of the group on the bus uh, afterwards too. Fabulous. Well, thank you for your comments. Mm -hmm. I'd now like to look at some additional photos of that trip to Alabama. Terry Turner, would you like to tell us what's going on in this photo here? Does that bring back any memories? Uh, yeah. Um, Is that the march? Yes, yes, Dewey Pruitt, and he used to be the uh, one of the uh, campus ministers. Uh, not that he was a minister of the Presbyter Presbyterian Church, the community church, and we were uh, getting together, getting ready to go out. Getting on the ready march. to go out on the march at that time. We were and waiting for a bus to take us out to the Getting ready for a bus, and we were kind of nervous, and we were just sitting around talking and trying to be as uh, as at ease as possible under the circumstance. So this photo is in Alabama now. There's a Selma. No, this is Montgomery, Alabama. Alabama. This is Montgomery. We never okay. went to Selma. We never went oh. to, except okay. to drive through there. Oh, I see. And uh, we uh, went to Montgomery. We got off the bus in Montgomery, and we joined the march on the way into Montgomery. And I we went see. Out to we were getting ready to go out and join the march. So were you meeting with people um, all over the states then, or, or well, we were who were you meeting with? Just people just that- Just generally talking to anybody who would talk to us, and uh, congregation from the church, different people around the community would come up and, and uh, give us a lot of support. And I remember myself getting a lot of support from people thinking, thanking me for coming down there. And to stand All up. the white guys were talking about Terry. No, only the black people. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, that wasn't quite. What happened? <laughs> oh, thank you, Terry. I would now like to introduce and feature Dick Holdstock. Thank you for joining us, Dick. Dick was an organizer for the California Conference on Families that Follow the Crops. A founding secretary and treasurer for the Davis Human Relations Council, and a founding member of Yolo County Economic Opportunity Commission, former president of the California Environmental Health Association, a McGovern delegate to the Democratic Party Convention in 1972, the Northern California Vice President of the California Democratic Council, the former chair of Yolo County Democratic Central Committee, the former chair of Davis Democratic Club, the founding secretary and treasurer of STAKE, elected to the Davis City Council in 1972, former president of Uman Davis Sister City Program that my mom went on, I remember. She sure did. Founding uh -huh. member of Yellow <laughs> County Citizens for Affirmative Action, and he supported the United Farm Workers by early participation in Delano, participated in Southern Christian Leadership Conferences Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C., was actively involved in anti-war activities and worked on several Davis City Council campaigns for progressive candidates. Like Welcome, Dick. <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell us what it was like getting prepared for the trip. How did everyone 
come together and, and really you know, put this into play in terms of working out logistical issues? What were the nuts and bolts of putting the well, trip together? You can together? imagine what an exciting time it was. Um, we watch on television the various demonstrations that took place in the South, the, um, the, what happened in Birmingham, Alabama with the dogs under people and the people being turned back at the bridge in Selma, Alabama. And we had a, a very articulate minister at the church that I belonged to at that time, which was the Dewey Pruitt mm -hmm. at the Davis Community Church. And his sermons just really, every time he spoke, I was, I was ready to go, whatever happened. I was a deacon in that church at the time. And they brought to the deacons meeting the telegram that came from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference asking for people to join them. And I said, right, where do I go? How do I do it? You know. And I pretty well decided I wanted to go, but I knew John because John had, uh, he, he gave the, his one and only, as I understand it, sermon at the Davis Community Church. <laughs> and there was one person <laughs> in the congregation that thought it was great. <laughs> and, and we were, we've been That's friends we're ever since. Up. And uh, Terry and I got to be buddies because mm -hmm. we worked together with the university. Mm -hmm. So um, that was an exciting time. And I was told that there was going to be a meeting to discuss going at the Kalagi Christian Association. <laughs> so I went there, Phil Walker, who was the, who was the uh, minister, pastor of the Methodist Church in Davis was there, and he was ready to go from the beginning. And John was there and, uh, uh, and several other people, but we sort of had trouble saying, well, if we were to go, what would we do and stuff like this, you know? So finally, someone said, let's talk about if, let's just decide we're gonna go, and then uh, we'll take it from there. And John pretty well led it from that point on. It really made a terrific difference. And I want to say that, you know, that as one person, I, I was employed. I had young children at home. When I came home and told my wife, Jackie, at the time, she said, well, she said, um, I think you should go. And she took on the job of get, organizing, getting the bus, and doing a lot of that original work. If it hadn't been for so many people behind the scenes, making things happen, it would never have happened. That people would never have gotten out of Davis. One of my best friends showed up with his money in his hand and wanted to go on the bus. He says, I, I want to go. He says, but I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm not going to sign the non-violence uh, uh, certificate you're supposed to have. I said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> you can't go. But we took his $75 anyway <laughs> and, and, and uh, <laughs> left him behind. He's never forgiven me for that. He, every time he sees me, he talks about it. Can you talk about the nonviolent certificate? Can you explain what that was? Yeah, about? maybe John, you you were more involved, and you were making well, us sign these damn things. I don't know what it said, but I just went ahead and signed it anyway. Well, one of the uh, principles of Southern Christian Leadership Conference was that of nonviolence, and uh, um, in any big march like that, or which involves a lot of social change, a number of groups come with different tactics and uh, uh, what was very important and significant to Southern Christian Leadership Conference was that we sign these uh, commitments to nonviolence. Um, partially because of their belief that this was the most significant way to make change. Partially probably for our uh, for our protection because a number of us uh, certainly didn't realize how difficult it was going to be once we got down there. That the uh, uh, many of us uh, out of our experience just had not any experiences to go on that were uh, that stressful or uh, uh, and I was just anger. Trying, to, trying to be a little bit funny there, but it, it's, it wasn't funny the, at all because we were very, very serious about the nonviolent commitment. Yes. And, uh, uh, it, uh, it was very important to all of us that uh, we follow through with the Gandhian philosophy that That's was right. behind the whole movement. And so it was, it was important and, and very valid to... Because there was a lot of social upheaval at the time and a lot of violent activities going on. The potential was, yeah. The potential, uh, potential. was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the promise was there uh, that uh, we, we could possibly do something. But I, sometimes, you know, when I think about it, I reflect back and think how little we did because the point was we were asked to come down there and we came in on one night, uh, like on, I think it was like a Thursday night into Montgomery, Alabama. 
and we stayed in this lovely little church and they were bussed out the next morning to join the marchers as they came in from Selma, Alabama. Mm. And then when we got into town that night, it poured rain and there was a concert. <laughs> it was in an open field with one light bulb hanging over the stage. And we saw John Baez, Peter Seeger, the... Um, P Bernstein. Yeah. Uh, Leonard Bernstein was there? Yes. Yeah. Who was the great black author that was there? Baldwin. James Baldwin. Baldwin. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, so, I mean, we could list a, a number of people, but it was the, one of the most beautiful concerts that I ever heard, and we were just up to our knees in mud, and just uh, being rained on the whole time. Yeah. But it felt wonderful, and warm inside. <laughs> no. Yeah, you didn't care. You didn't care. You <laughs> were with people that had that goodwill that was coming from all over the country, and the the kind of the way that the people in the church, this little black Baptist church in Montgomery received us was so beautiful. I mean, I tell you, that talk about Southern hospitality. And that hard pew we slept on was so warm. It was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was a beautiful... Was Tony Bennett there too? I believe he was. Yes. I, I, gosh, I mean, that was that night, uh, uh, you, you didn't want to leave. You just mm -hmm. stood there, it was pouring, right? <laughs> Completely. So it was surprising we didn't get sick, but it was so, such a lovely thing, you know? Oh, that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like to now turn to another photo, and maybe we can reminisce a little bit about that. This looks like more marching. Uh, oh, that was that was wet time, and we were. That's us in this little crowd over here in the were, corner, waiting for the people coming. That is the march coming from Selma, so and they went past. It took hours almost to get past them. Right. We got on the end of the line. The guys that provided the sewage, the little sewers, little uh, toilets along the way for that was the uh, seminary from San Anselmo. They, they closed the seminary down and the entire seminary came out to that march. Mm -hmm. And they drove trucks along and set up toilets along the road and provided water. They did the dirty work for the whole march. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what impressed me were all the people who would come out of their houses mm -hmm. and they waved their hankies and they go, you know, I think I'm gonna just join you and they'd walk with us, yeah. and women in canes, and they could hardly walk, but they'd come and join us and, and uh, walk with us, and, uh, and they would thank us for coming. And uh, th that really helped, because you had all these hostile eyes and stuff around as, on the side as well. So we had a lot of warm, beautiful hugs and kind of support from the black community. Yeah, so true. we got as much violent uh, visual contact with whites uh, as we did black people who was nice. So it was really uh, a really interesting contrast all the time. Very so, uh, and it was raining. We were well protected by the National Guard. They were flying helicopters over all the time. They had, uh, they had an army all along the side of the road. They had uh, uh, all kinds of uh, jeeps with, uh, full of uh, soldiers that were there to make sure nothing happened. You know? mm -hmm. so it was pretty, pretty amazing. Okay. And that march like, was only about four people wide. And it was it had to be two or three miles long, maybe longer. Oh yeah, mm. Mm -hmm. it was really. I mean, you, we, I just stood there and cried as I saw those good people that had that had really put the work into. Other than what, you know, it was lovely for us to come there and be able to join them, but they did all the work. I mean, uh, it was amazing. They took the risk. Really. Everyone took yeah. the risk. It sounds like. Everyone but we didn't take much risk compared to them. Yeah. 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 You know, there were there's so many vignettes so that you remember, but the the, the two I like to talk about is when I'm getting off the bus. Oh yeah. I uh, I have uh, I was <laughs> trying to direct things and I uh, was walked off the bus and a I, glorious leader. <laughs> I, I had no clue and there were so many people and uh, so much chaos going on that I thought, well, I guess we I guess I've lost it now. And uh, a uh, Afro American that shined shoes said, Do you want your shoes signed? Sir, and I said, Not right now. It's the last thing I want. <laughs> I've got a, he said, Well, I'll shine them free. And so he shined my shoes, and while he was shining them without ever looking up, gave me the phone number that we were to call. <laughs> that was one experience of, of safety, uh, you know. The other was that af after the uh, events were over and the king had spoken, I went to get uh, some flowers for uh, the people of the church because they had cooked for us and, and uh, 
and been such great hosts. And every once in a while, even though by then the sense of, of conflict was there, uh, I was in such a hurry that I took a, a cab to a florist in the white section of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was there with my $20 bill that we had collected to buy these flowers, I noticed at the back of the florist shop that uh, there was no sound coming. And all of a sudden this fear uh, hit me that I was essentially in the wrong florist nice. shop. Mm -hmm. And so I took the flowers, put the $20, and walked out. And then I was again confronted with what am I going to do now? I've got no idea where I am. And a Afro-American uh, cab driver came up and he said, get in. <laughs> you just did the stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so he was watching out. Uh, there was a sense of uh, uh, people watching out for you, you know, uh, which you know, that happens in life that people do watch out for <laughs> each other. Yeah. And so, okay. goodness gracious. Well, I'd now like to turn to Terry Turner. Terry was a founding member of the Racial Justice Action Group at the Davis Unitarian Church and was also a founding member of the Davis Human Relations Council. He has participated in many human rights awareness sessions for the church. As chair and founding member of the Yolo County Citizens for Affirmative Action, he influenced its rapid expansion and put extended effort into bringing together Davis organizations such as NOW, the Rainbow Coalition, and the Cross-Cultural Center at UC Davis, and others to work for civil rights with a focus on voter registration. As founding member and chair of Friends of the Rutilio Grande, the Davis Sister City Project with Rutilio Grande, El Salvador, Terry has contributed to assistance projects, including getting electricity to the community, buying computers for the community at large, and building a civic center and providing scholarships. Thank you for joining us, Terry. What propelled you to go on this bus trip? Well, I, I wrote some notes here and I thought, well, what did, I guess I could say, uh, for generations of um, Jim Crow mm -hmm. that I grew up in in Cincinnati. I didn't grow up in California and I did and I grew up in a segregated world mm -hmm. as, and me and my family did uh, back through my grandmother. My, you know my grandmother was born a slave and so they always uh, kept me in touch with that to be proud and to know that. My family was very socially conscious of these things. They always thought about what they would like to be uh, musicians, poets, great intellectuals, artists, artists, which I've become and a teacher, and uh, I'm a professor also at Yuba College. I'd like to say, and um, they they supported me in doing all these things. But this was all my family's things that they wanted to do for themselves, and they told me that I was uh, given the blessing to be born in this chaos and to do that. So I had a lot of support from them in order to do things like go on that march. In fact, they, uh, s my mother had suggested I did strongly to do so. Uh, she was a person who had a strong spirit and a, and a strong voice. And she had also told John about the serious difficulties we may run into going down there. I had already known about serious difficulties. I grew up in Cincinnati, and there were serious difficulties growing up from day to day. So I had no problem with that. In fact, when I was down south there in Selma, the black community asked me to help get these white people into that church. <laughs> so I did. And uh, then they asked me, you said, now you stay in there. We don't need for you to come out here. We'll take care of this. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, but if you need me, I'll come out there. So we know that. You go eat and uh, go talk to them. So these uh, nice sisters and stuff, they took care of us and kept us warm and nice and, and asked me, he said, anytime I would ever like to come back, please come back and they were so happy to have me. And they thought it was very important that black people was able to stand up and, and fight for what was needed. Well, my whole family always stood up and fought what was needed and told me to always speak and pray and never have, never let other people do your work and do your job for you. So that was one reason I went, because at first I was concerned about this nonviolent activity. I mean, I grew up in Cincinnati. I was a ghetto kid. A young man. In fact, I, I knew a lot about street. 
So when I came here, you asked me about Davis. Well, Davis to me was just a very odd place. Mm -hmm. So I was, grew up in big urban ghetto of Cincinnati, which later I found out was a ghetto. It was a black community, which I visited recently. I went back to see and it hasn't changed. So uh, I was thinking, you know, those same people still sitting there waiting for that bus, and I used to wait on that bus with them to go downtown. So uh, we were poor, and uh, my family uh, was considered maybe middle class for black, but that was poor. So for everybody else, uh, we lived in, uh, in Cincinnati, we lived in one big house, a whole family. Mm -hmm. And my aunt would catch the pigeons on the ceiling to eat pigeons, so we'd have pigeon under glass and stuff, you know, <laughs> so <laughs> stuff like that. So that's how we lived, you know, and my, you know, my aunt and all of them, you know, they worked for white people's maids, and my mother was a nurse, and my father worked for Dr. Schmidt, who came out here with the primate center. Oh. So uh, I was propelled by all of that to not work at the primate center. <laughs> And because I didn't want to catch monkeys yeah. and get scarred <laughs> up like my brothers did, and those diseases as they caught too, mm -hmm. from doing that. So I didn't. I, I was taught not to do that by them and my stepfather and my mother. So I started working here in the community in it, at the uh, university, and uh, it was a serious thing for me to go down there. I, I was not making a lot of money. I was just a lab assistant, mm -hmm. and I didn't have a position as John or Dick did, and I was a uh, still poor, and I would like to be an artist, but I didn't have any money, and uh, so um, I just, I went, and uh, I think maybe I took that $75 that Dick's good friend yes. had, and I went, and I found a little bit of other money to go. So I went, and I got my only suit that I had. I, I had a whole lot when I came from Cincinnati, but I didn't have many left. It was a year later, and so um, I got a suit and a tie, which I didn't, I seldom wore, and went in that march. I remember the water sloshing in my shoes and and I remember the people, they were just like Cincinnati except it was in the south, so I wasn't too concerned. It was, south is not far from Cincinnati, it's just over the river into Kentucky. So I was used to that and I'm used to segregation and I was used to prejudice. I didn't like it, never did and still don't. And I really believe in civil rights and so forth and that's also one of the reasons propelled me to do some of the work with uh, El Salvador and others. I've been in Nicaragua also. I remember going to Nicaragua and my friends was down there with me. said, what do you think of Nicaragua? I go, man, this is one huge ghetto. This is really great. Like them, they dance good. We have a good time. <laughs> like this stuff, we can go and dance and have a little cerveza and have some fun and que pasa and all that stuff, you know. So uh, that was my life and uh, I grew through that. It took me through that to get a degree, several degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, in a sense, I, I followed the issues of what my family wanted me to do. My mother died of cancer. She lived here for a while, went back to Ohio, and told me I had to stay and not go back. Because she said, you know, you're only going to end up in jail because you're going to get mad and you know, you're not going to do it right, so you got to stay here, go to school. I mean, she was right. A lot of my friends did. That's where they went. <laughs> and so, uh, and, uh, they became, you know, postmen or whatever they could, and I still have friends there. And um, I was lucky in a sense, I came here, and my mother was so strong. Mm -hmm. She put a lot of emphasis on that, and for me to go fight for freedom and, and these issues, of which I still do. Yeah. I had an uncle that got lynched too, right? I had an uncle in 1914, was lynched in Ohio. Yeah. He got mad at a policeman. You know, we don't like to be told stuff. He was mad at, you know, because he had an argument with a woman and a policeman came and told him, you know, called him a boy and said, you know, you can't be doing this. And so uh, the policeman pulled out a gun at him and so he shot the policeman. And then he told the policeman, he said, okay, I'm wrong, sir. I'm wrong. I'm guilty. And so they took him to jail. And this is why I'm so strong and adamant about civil rights and social issues and and why uh, people get mad at me a lot, but I really believe once we are guilty, time to lay off. Because they drug him out of the jail, right? Mm -hmm. And took him down the street and put him on a pole and shot him 50 times. Cussed him, lynched him. And then they went out on the levee and shot up and burned down houses to every black person they could see. Now, the man has said he was guilty. He said, I was wrong. Take me to court and let's do this. And so I believe in the law and not 
people taking personal actions on people. So I really believe in our following the laws mm -hmm. and using fighting our for law. Fighting for civil rights. And fighting for civil rights through law and not through personal vendettas or personal feelings. Or and I hatred. And that really bothers me. That gets me really fired up, mm -hmm. which is part of the reason I went to Selma and do these things. And my, as well as I said, my great-grandmother was born in slavery. She told me. They took me to Cynthiana, Kentucky. I know all those places we went. My mother told me about riding in the cable, in the cattle cars. And I remember riding in the train. Recently, I went over to, with Charles Holmes and his daughter, to Sacramento. There's a train exhibit over there about uh, the Pullman, that Pullman's Union, mm -hmm. Pullman Ford, A. Okay. Phil Randolph. So, and I was thinking, you know, the train, they had that union. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first unions for black workers, but it was the last union for the, for the trains, because the trains at that time was probably the most segregated of all institutions uh -huh. in the United States, because we all had to sit in separate cars. Mm -hmm. And there was a dining car there that had really nice linen and nice stuff. And I was thinking, I couldn't have ever ate it at this table. I could work at the kitchen, yeah. and I could have been a Pullman, but I was too young. But that's what my family would have been. Yeah. And so I had to tell Charles Holmes' <laughs> daughter this, so we're teaching her this. Mm -hmm. And I'm teaching my kids this, and they're going, well, and my daughter says, that's like an old movie, Dad. What is that? You know, so. Uh, but it's, but it's really important for people to understand because I believe that our anger and hatred still is there. And um, as my good friend the Reverend here pointed out, mm -hmm. and I think we do have to keep working in these issues. Absolutely. And I agree with you too. I've heard some of those stories from my relatives. It's like, you know, it used to be that black people couldn't go there and it's mm -hmm. somewhere, a public place where everyone goes. Mm -hmm. So It's hard yeah. for you to understand. One that. of the yeah. people that. that was on that bus was a, a Baptist minister, black Baptist minister yeah. from Sacramento. And we got into, I think it was Nashville. We got, was it in Nashville? Did we stop in mm -hmm. Nashville, John? We stopped in Nashville. Yeah. I think it was Nashville. We it stopped there Nashville. and we had a two hour layover before the next bus took off. And he, had the, he was very sick, this minister. So Terry and I walk, went with him, and we went to the hospital right across the road from the bus station. They said they couldn't take care of him there. He had to go to the other the <laughs> colored <laughs> hospital down the road. So we ran down the street. I think we maybe even got a taxi and went down mm -hmm. there. And there, you know, there was this great long line of people standing there waiting, a forlorn group of people waiting to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we finally did get him in, and we just barely made it back by the skin of our teeth. To, right. To, uh, to, that, to, to catch the bus. Well, On that note, I'd like to look at some more photos. Yeah. I, I have something that might be relevant to what we're discussing right now. Terry, why don't you get us started? Can you tell us about this photo? Oh, yeah. I remember that very well. We were marching into summer, headed right for the capital. capital no, to Montgomery. To Montgomery. In Montgomery, I'm sorry. I keep blowing this. Yeah. Montgomery. <laughs> so we were. We were seeing the Capitol building from, it was like walking out of Capitol Mall, looking at the yeah. California Capitol. You could see it. And uh, we were going by there. And I was sort of being on guard a little bit because I could see these guys over there. These guys were having, they had large clubs and they were spitting on this man with his glasses on. He was a minister here he in Davis. This this that's Reverend this yeah. right up front. Right. He was the minister of the community church. Mm -hmm. uh, and he kept walking out there on the edge. And we kept saying, do it. you can't do this. You can't. You got to come in the middle. He goes, but I'm going to do this and I got my price. So he would walk on his collar. These guys were getting madder and madder. He had and his collar on. He had his collar on. And he's walking out there. His color, so Looked very proud. Me and, and a couple of other African Americans, we went out and so we just went and got between him and those guys and pushed him in. So I remember that and uh, I said, We're all gonna get killed here. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was gonna happen. I said, I knew it was gonna happen by coming here, but here it goes, but I can't <laughs> at least we're gonna do is try to protect this man at this point. So myself and Malcolm and there were some other African Americans there. And, about, and we all kind of got in and moved him inside. But I remember that it was a very frightening moment. Yeah. I'd um, now like to turn to what resulted in from all of these um, protests and everything that you all participated in or sharing your stories with us this evening. 
Upon the arrival, the return of the bus riders to this trip to Alabama, what there was created the Davis Human Relations Council. I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. The Davis Human Relations Council was incorporated April 29, 1966. The Articles of Incorporation state that its specific and primary purposes are the following. A. To organize the resources of the whole community and bring to pass in practical manner, both in this area and in the nation, equality of opportunity regardless of race, color, creed, ancestry, including but not limited to housing, employment, voting rights, and education. B. To provide good offices at, for mediation and specific of specific local issues involving equality of opportunity. And C. To offer mediation services to governmental entities, both local and non-local. And some of the results of the actions taken by the bus riders were the, and the, of course, the forming of the Davis Human Relations Council, which I understand is now the Davis Human Relations Commission. Has no, involved. They're, they're totally different. <laughs> totally <laughs> different. Okay. Right. In any event, um, the actions included the following. The results of the actions included the following. Um, establishing the Diogenes House and helped obtain funding from county grants totaling some $30,000 for the first year, assigned lease for property, applied for grants, and established Diogenes as a nonprofit corporation, established migrant child care under pilot program funding over $30,000 in one year. And I'm just going to skip through some of these. Supported the Children's Center, uh, supported the Davis Free Clinic, and supported alternatives in birth control, supported Project Tutor supported the NAACP, and supported Hunger Hike and Big Brothers of the, the Big Brothers Association of Davis, and supported the United Farm Workers Union. And again, I'd like to thank you all for, for your involvement. And, and some of us today get to reap the benefits of, of all of your hard work and, and the efforts that you've made for, towards civil rights. Um, I'd now like to turn to you, Timothy, and see um, what you would like to add to all of this discussion. I interviewed our bus riders, but, but um, in light of our discussion, what do you have to say, some conclusionary observation remarks? Well, I'd just like to say that we are, are standing on the, um, the shoulders of giants, that, that many people will pay the price for us to be able to, for me even, for an example, just to, to live in Davis. I mean, um, 30 years ago, I couldn't live here. It was hard for an African American even to live in the city of Davis. Um, and uh, if you look at UC Davis, over half of the student body is um, um, children of color, people of color. Um, and um, that's unheard of. So things are changing. Um, but we have a long way to go. We have a lot of work still left to be done. We've never had an African American president. We've never had a Latino or Latina president. We never had a female president. We never had a, 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 um, an Asian president. <laughs> we never had a Muslim president. We never had a Jewish president. I mean, we still have a long way to go before our Native American president, whose land this is we, we all stand on, uh -huh. you know. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we still have a, we still have a long way to go. So I think that um, it also shows you that people in power do not give it up uh, willingly. Uh, power is something that resists change and uh, we have to struggle in order to make the change that happen and sacrifice. And as Dr. King did, um, even sometimes uh, we have to be willing to even um, risk our lives. But uh, freedom and the price of freedom is, is very important and I think the price of freedom is worth paying any price so that our children and our grandchildren can enjoy even more freedom than we now enjoy. And uh, I think one day we'll get there. We, we shall overcome, as Dr. Martin Luther King uh, would sing and, and all of the marches many years ago in a, and still a favorite song right now. Someday we shall overcome. We will be free. Well, thank you, Timothy. Thank you. Um, I have a question for all of you that I'd like to uh, run around the table. Um, you gave us some uh, stories about what it was like going there and, and how it all got started and, and some of the um, experiences you had interacting with the you know, um, racial conflict issues therein. Um, can you tell me, um, how did this experience change your life? Why don't we start with you, Reverend Pamperin? Well, I, 
I think the most significant thing was the experience itself, actually being there. Uh, it was preceded by studying at seminary, admiring Martin Luther King, reading his writings. But what the experience itself did was kind of experientially say, gee, these things are really possible. Uh, you know, this is really worthwhile to be influenced by this. Uh, this would be fun to uh, commit your, my life to. Um, uh, this is much more worthwhile than other avenues of opportunity that were, were given to me. And I uh, really feel that uh, it provided a, uh, uh, a beginning of what I feel is a very meaningful life. And uh, that the, the excitement of seeing uh, people of various backgrounds and color uh, break through and uh, share that culture. That, that hymn sing was a big deal for me because I didn't like those hymns very well until I heard that church sing it. But now it means uh, uh, there is a chance always to meet the change. There is always the faith that you can meet that change uh, and, and, and perhaps provide some justice and some fairness and some opportunity. And uh, in, the, in the process of the change, as, as difficult as it is, it is very exciting to see that you make a next step and the benefits of cultures uh, sharing uh, their history is, is Again, uh, in the most profound sense, uh, the American dream. So. Sure is. How about you, Dick? How did, how did this experience change your life? Well, in so many ways, I, I felt so strongly uh, when I was there that, that I was not doing enough. I, I just did what I was told to do, either march, go out there and march back in and just do the little things that we could do because we didn't want to be in the way of those that were really doing the job. But nevertheless, it was wonderful to be there and just give our own testimony for the fact that we were solid with them, and that's really what they wanted. But then on the way back, we talked, you know, isn't there something here? We must, we're a bunch of hypocrites. We're going down there and telling these guys how they should change their lives and what they should do, and yet we've got so much stuff going on here locally. In fact, every single house in Davis had a restrictive covenant on it in those days that specifically said this house could not be sold to a person of color or to a Jew. That's what the house that I owned had that on it. Mm. I didn't know it until I looked in the fine print, <laughs> and there it was. And so the first thing we did was to get busy and going around telling everybody the Byron Fair Rumford Act, uh, Byron Rumford Fair Housing Act I prohibits you first that. told them that you weren't black or Jewish. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was easy for me because I could step back and go back to being the respectable big old stock with his tie and all that sort of thing, you know? But uh, I'm glad that I, I stuck my neck out and will continue to do so until we see a little bit more parity in this society. So, How about you, Terry? How did this experience change your life? Well, I think it's given me a lifelong sense that, um, well, let me go back. I, I had to mature, and, and, and I, it became a lifelong process of translation of all of this work, and I, uh, it probably propelled me through school and uh, my education and the realization that uh, I always have to do this and to never go backwards, to try to continually to go forward and to try to help the youth, try to help others. Um, it, it gave me a place and um, a place that was uh, seemingly always temporary, but in the long run it hasn't been. I thought it was temporary and transitory, but it's given me a lot more concrete place to be. And um, um, I, I can never be doing the work that I've done or been able to do because of this. I can never be the victim and never accept it. And I never accepted victimization of it or even 
being that. So I become a uh, a person that's six foot tall, or, and, and I'm but I feel like I'm seven foot all the time, and um, I don't ever feel like I have to stutter, stammer, slur, shuffle, whatever. I like to walk tall, high, and jump, and I feel like there's nothing that I can't do. And so I like to be able to um, project that to other people, particularly young people, to feel like uh, never say no, don't tell me you can't, only we will and you can if you want to. It's your choice. And so I like to, I've told that to my son. I've probably said that to you sometime. Probably. And I've said it to <laughs> my daughter and uh, my brother and all these other people because it's really important to me. Uh, we have to go forward and we can't feel, um, we, can, we can change it only if we don't feel badly about our, who we are. I think we've been really lucky in a sense because we're here as teachers, we're going to teach all of this nation how to be free. And that's what I think about black people have had that unique opportunity. And I'm one of those people. I've had a unique opportunity to teach the entire population of the United States how to be free. And now I've carried that down to Mexico and Central America and Nicaragua. And we're going to do it every place. So I really think it's really good. So Florida. So, and, Washington, D.C. And, 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 and we're not finished. So it's, and, and so you can do it through dance and music and art. And there's this wonderful show on uh, PBS about jazz, which is talking about that, which that is all about. My family were jazz musicians and so forth. And that so it reminisces a lot of things for me. And so um, we can teach. We can be, and we are. And uh, my grandfather worked at the uh, hotel, which we wasn't allowed to go to. Mm -hmm. Now I've taken a picture of him and those guys sitting there with those white jackets, and they'd all have pretty sorrowful faces on, pretty, mm. But I put it on a painting, so therefore people can see it, so it'll be there for eternity for people to see what it was like for my grandfather to work in that hotel, taking care of whites, taking care of their fur coats and making sure their doors opened and everything was clean and nice and all of their nice linen was there and he couldn't have any of his family in there. So anyway, uh, I think he, I, I really honor him. He's, he is a person, his name was Pete, and uh, he's a person that I really honor and respect as well as my great-grandmother and all of these people. So I respect them all, and they're all my heroes. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to pass that on to all of you. So that's what we're doing. We have a whole legacy of wonderful heroes that survived. And uh, we survived slavery. And I don't care what anybody said, it's never going to be that way again. It can't <coughs> be. Colonization is over. So this is post-colonial period. We're going to keep going. I don't care what they want to take us back. It will never happen. They can forget it. It's done. So uh, it may be, uh, and, you know, today is post-industrial and all those <coughs> good things. I'm glad. We need to continue to go forward, you know. This popular culture is not too bad. So I think we all should start playing a saxophone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you very I much, Terry. You guys play part of that. I, <gasps> I know. Oh, my that. goodness. I know, or coach, yeah. or and all those things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, obviously, we're having this program today, the legacy of Martin Luther <laughs> King in Davis, to commemorate the Martin Luther King holiday, which is Monday, January 15th, 2001. I'd also like to invite everyone to the Martin Luther King program, which will be held at 12 noon in the Davis Central Park. That's on C Street. I believe it's 3rd and C. Is that 3rd and C? Yeah. 3rd mm -hmm. and C. So I'd like to invite um, all local community members and people from out of town to come to the Davis area to join us in our Freedom March and Martin Luther King program. And, please, and, and Sunday at the Com Davis Community Church. 2 o'clock. Uh, you, we're we're out of time, but but it's Sunday Davis Community Church two o'clock two o'clock two, two, two to five. There's another Senior program. Senior okay, too. everyone, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, have a nice evening and happy Martin Luther King holiday. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Right, I like to fly by your ticket at the station on the rock island line. Well, the train left Memphis at a half past nine. Well,
Well, it made it back to Little Rock at 849. I says, Rock Island Line. 